Howdy folks, this is Brian Husky and we're going to kick off my first essay of the 2019 archery season. I hope you enjoy the ride. Chapter 1, Belly of the Beast. I've always loved storms, late summer thunderstorms in particular, but any kind of weather that's remarkable is worth remarking in my book. And as a little kid on the Oregon coast, I can recall a few instances when major storms would slam the Tillamook region and the larger-than-life old-growth trees of the community would occasionally be blown over. The devastating look of shattered wood and crushed surroundings was fascinating to me. With every enormous tree I'd gaze upward at, I'd imagine what it would look like to break or be uprooted and come crashing down to earth. It was simply the way that the mind of this young boy worked. And every time violent storms rolled in off the Pacific Ocean, I'd watch from our living room window at the row of towering hemlock that bordered the neighboring dairy pasture. The powerful winds forced the trees to flex and bend back and forth together like dancers on a stage. I would gaze in wonder as the branches would be pushed in unison to reveal straining tension in the undersides of boughs seldom seen. Sometimes I'd even pretend a tree was a giant fishing rod, and tied to it was a huge shark in the nearby Wilson River that pulled and thrashed from the end of the line. I remember one particularly rough and stormy night would have been in 1983 or 4, I'd guess. My father was a state trooper, and late that night he'd stopped home on break. Running out to greet him in my PJs, I was so excited to ask him if any big trees had blown down. As a patrol officer, he was made aware by radio of anything happening in the region, and he reported back to me that there were indeed several large trees down that were blocking various roads and highways. I asked with beaming excitement if in the morning he would take me to see. And that next day, I jumped out of bed like it was Christmas morning, put on my shiny black rubber boots. Indulging my excitement, my dad drove us around through the receding floodwaters to see workers cutting remains of huge trees from local streets. I was enthralled by the disruption storms could cause in toppling trees and flooding rivers. This attraction to nature's tantrums has never really left. And each time dark clouds develop on the horizon, my spirits lift with hopes of a real doozy. I don't really watch broadcast TV, but I'm aware there's a show, maybe even a profession, called Storm Chasers. I may have missed my calling on that one. I'd been creeping along a narrow ridge that was filthy with elk sign, both old and new. It was mid-afternoon, September 6, 2019 now and I was certain that a herd of elk occupied the next few hundred yards of this finger-like feature of alpine terrain. I knew they were bedded down and catching a bit of shut-eye. I was interested in the same, and as I often do, I sought out an established elk bed to kick back, remove my heavy pack, and let the natural settings around me overlook my presence for a while. Bugling elk had kept me up for most of the night prior, and I was exhausted. The chance to close my eyes and just be in this country was relaxing enough to knock me out, if only for half an hour or so. It was a pesky carpenter ant crawling across my face that eventually disrupted my slumber. This irritated me greatly, as while I was napping, I was finally getting a reprieve from the nagging pain of a shoulder injury that was especially aggravated by my heavy hunting pack. Thunder rolled around somewhere in the faint distance. I began a series of stretches in an effort to quell the dull, knotted pain in my back, and as I did this rotation, I noticed that the sky behind me, to the south, had turned black. Moments later, a soft push of wind delivered the unmistakable smell of rain mixed with the hot Indian summer air. I spun my backpack that served as a backrest 180 degrees so I could sit and admire the storm front as it developed. A curtain of white formed along its leading edge, and I could see now just how fast it was moving. Lightning started splashing horizontally from side to side of the scene I was taking such great interest in. In a matter of minutes, this cloud veil was swallowing the opposite side of the canyon that I was perched upon. Still a few miles away, I could actually see it overtaking features of terrain. It was moving in my direction, and I was thrilled, even hopeful. To be inside this towering storm. However, it was soon evident that I was the only one welcoming the approach of this rapidly intensifying event. 
Just down the ridge, from exactly where I'd anticipate the herd of elk to be, cow calls began to flutter into the air. They were a different sound of calls, though. They sounded, well, worried. With the elk making their location known, I seized the opportunity to hone in on them. Arrow knocked, I calculated where the sounds were coming from, and made my way through the old-growth conifer forest. All the light in the sky had been affected by the storm, which now cast its eerie tint like a bizarre Instagram filter. The air felt thick and became very calm, although rumbling of thunder and slashing winds in the distance made something of a roar in the background. I pulled up my phone as I walked to capture some of these sights and sounds that I found so strange. It was creepy, and I loved it. Passing between two large boulders, I emerged to spot the telltale tan color of elk bodies about 80 yards ahead of me. They were frozen still at first, then broke into a run. I was perplexed, wondering how I could have possibly spooked them. But quickly I saw that they were not running away from me, but across, perpendicular to my path. All around me, elk sounds intensified into a chorus of wary sounding warnings. I could tell this herd was making haste to get off the ridge, and in doing so, were heading to my left to cross above a large rock slide that draped a sea of unpassable obstacles in a crescent shape around the elk. They were lining out to relocate, and I anticipated their path would lead them to a steep tree line off the edge below me. This was an opportunity that if I moved quickly, I could seize upon. The first blast of wind hit hard, like standing alongside a highway when a semi-truck flies by at 75. The air was filled with a constant roar as every needle from each branch of every pine clung to its home. Lightning flashed so bright, I literally blinked my eyes in an effort to get the white spots from my vision. My ears would have been ringing from the smashing thunder if it were calm enough to hear the ringing. I think the lightning was air to air, as I don't recall feeling strikes hitting the ground, but the scene was so intense and chaotic I can't say for sure. I do know from all around I could hear trees breaking and crashing to the ground. The immense wall of white I'd noted from miles away had closed in with a blast of cold. Like a thick fog, it suddenly surrounded me, and with it came a driving rain. The first drops pelted the ground so hard they hit like miniature bombs, and puffs of tiny dust rose from the craters in the dry soil. The rain soon turned to hail, flying in sideways on the wind, casting swooping tracers of white behind each pellet. Clouds, fog, thunder, lightning, wind, rain, hail, all scenes of natural fury that as a child I yearned to experience firsthand were cascading down all around me. It was without question the most intense storm I've ever encountered. Yet in a twist of irony, I barely gave it notice. For every fiber, every sense of my being was focused, transfixed in a tunnel, a small opening in the trees that I was running to reach, which panicked elk were now passing through. A handful of cows were already through the opening and to my left, but to my right were many more, where I eventually knew the bull would join. Nearly all the elk were talking, possibly even shouting or screaming out loud, trying to direct each other on where to go and what to do. In this moment of chaos, I closed in quickly. Back and knees bent, I shuffled awkwardly ahead like a soldier ducking live fire, scanning heads, disregarding anything but a direct stare in my direction, and completely ignoring my footing or noise my steps made. As the storm was so loud, I could have been clapping and I doubt the elk would have heard me. Like a lion in a swirling herd of wildebeests, I scrambled towards the elk in sprints and then short-lived pauses. I had to get into position to shoot before the bull crossed the steep downhill shooting lane. I kept closing the distance until I spotted the bull emerge into view. Instantly, I could tell he was in fact the bull of my dreams. A massive, typical framed 6x6 with the fantasy feature of matching crown points, making him an absolutely iconic 7x7 herd bull. In the moment, I didn't have time nor the interest in details of his rack. I just recall seeing those features and dropping to a knee. My eyes flashed back to the shooting lane in front of me. It was only about the size of a closet door. Cows were filing past the opening, and I quickly deduced the range and downhill angle. Shoot for 30, I said to myself. The bull had stopped just as I spotted him and was looking back in the direction he'd come. 
as if to make sure everyone in the burning building was going to make it out okay. He resumed his panic trot now, and from right to left was approaching the gap through which I'd need to shoot. I pulled my bow to full draw. None of the elk were looking in my direction. They were all passing broadside below me, but like myself, every one of them was looking this storm in the face. It was crazy how loud it was. I clearly remember anchoring my draw and with my left eye, finding my vision through the peep in my string and alignment of pins. I set my aim to the open gap and counted down from the top pin, 20, green, 30, red. Once I had my pin confirmed, I opened my right eye to enable peripheral vision to scan, to be ready for when the bull would be approaching the opening. My heart was slamming in my chest as a cow broke into the open space of my visual window. Her mouth was open, likely as she was calling out, but no sound made it beyond the roar of the wind. I swear to God I could see panic in her eyes. I looked to the right and I could see that the bull was coming next. There was no time to hope, but I'm sure I was hoping that he would stop in the opening. In hindsight, I can do all this thinking now, but at the moment, everything I'm describing happened as reflex reactions. There was no opportunity to stop the bull for a shot. The process alone of sending out a sound to stop the bull would have drawn too much focus from the shot. And thinking back, I could have yelled and I don't think the bull would have even heard it. Even if he did, the shooting lane was so narrow, there was just too much risk of him stopping at the wrong time without his vitals visible. Deploying a halting sound didn't even occur to me. Everything in me was focused on executing a perfect shot as he ran through the lane. These memories feel like slow motion as I look back on them now. All these details I'm describing are like crystal clear high definition video in my mind. As the bull's nose broke the plane of the gap in the trees, I recall setting my pins at shoulder height. I recall how hard the wind was hitting me in the face, squinting as tight as possible to prevent raindrops or hail from hitting me directly in the eye. As the bull's midsection came into view, I remember tracking my pins along with him for the few feet that I could see him. I remember a gust of wind pushing my bow down and having to lift upward to reset my aim. I remember dropping my finger on the release and in the rage of the storm, watching in disbelief as my arrow passed cleanly beneath the bull's chest. Clear daylight separated the tiny X shape of my arrow from the black belly of the beast. And now we roll into chapter two of my 2019 archery elk season called Royal Crown. The bull gave a small jump and kicked up his tempo, although with no idea of what, if anything, had happened. My arrow had just zinged beneath him, and I think he had a sense of some sort of close shave. He and the cows around him continued their frantic scurry off the exposed ridge. I didn't have time to consider what had happened to foil what should have been a slam dunk shot. The elk were still unaware of my presence, and I was right in their midst with the violent storm, providing multiple layers of cover for me to take advantage of. Yes, I could have knocked another arrow and almost certainly selected a shot from any of the many elk yet to pass through the window. But this bull was incredible, and without hesitation, I swiveled to my feet and started running parallel to the herd. The break of the ridgeline and mix of timber and downfall gave me just enough cover to pursue the herd as they continued their way down the hill. I was pretty much able to run as fast as I wanted, which was not very fast considering I was wearing a heavy backpack and carrying a bow with a knocked arrow. But I could make out glimpses of the herd as I rallied down the ridge, trying to get ahead of the big bull once again. I felt like Kevin Costner in Dances with Wolves. I was practically running within the bodies of elk the way he ran among the first herd of buffalo he encountered. With so much noise from the running elk, the thunder and the wind, it felt like it was a free-for-all and a foot race. Everything was moving too, as branches fell from trees and pine boughs waved in a constant fanning of wind gusts. I caught another glimpse of the bull, such a monster. He was trotting downhill among the rumps of his harem. Wide and heavy, this second look at the bull and his rack sincerely stunned me from this behind perspective. Most notable, of course, were his matching crown points. At least 10 inches long, both protruded from the bases of his fourth points, known as the dagger or royal tines on an elk rack. A trait common among red stags of Europe, this crown feature on American elk is like a genetic artifact that very few seem to reveal. It's not totally uncommon, 
But this is the first time that I'd seen a crown point in person, much less a matching set. Back in maybe 2004 when calling for my buddy Adam, we encountered a crown point bull. I'll never forget the look on Adam's face and his hand gestures as he described the huge bull that came into our setup. As caller, I retreated backwards in an effort to pull the bull past Adam for a shot. And so in doing so, I never had a chance to see the elk myself. The bull spooked and fled on Adam's draw. However, he became an instant icon in our imaginations of what massive bull elk with extra non-typical points look like. I've always dreamt of non-typical antlers, crown points, and devil tines. Nuances indeed for those of us who can relate to a lust for antler. A few minutes into my high-speed pursuit, the violent front of the storm had given way to much more stable conditions. Although the gusting wind had calmed, it was still raining hard, and thunder and lightning continued to fill the air without a chance for a moment of silence to get a word in edgewise. The elk were slowing and cows were beginning to stack up, seemingly debating among themselves how much further to drop. In the franticness of the situation, the herd had really strung out, and I couldn't tell where the bull was. I took a knee to scan the animals in front of me, watched to see the ones that were still incoming, hoping for another shot at the royal crown bull. Moments later, a bugle echoed through the towering tree trunks, but its origin was yet further down the slope, informing me that I had not gained enough ground to catch up to him. As I leaned back to rise up and resume my pursuit, sharp and staggering pain shot through my left quad. Another all-too-familiar ailment had returned to haunt me. A crippling pain, I knew exactly what was setting in and how limited my mobility would be until the cramp relaxed. Frustrated, I adjusted my position and decided to call off the hounds, pull out my phone, and document the crazy events that had just taken place. Well... This big storm came over, and sure enough, the elk were right where I thought they would be, and as soon as the storm got close, the cows started talking, so it confirmed that they were where I thought. I was able to totally get in line. They all lined up and were moving along the ridge. I shot and missed a seven-point herd bull, six by six with crowns. I shot him for 30 steep downhill and my arrow sailed right underneath him. I couldn't believe it. Now in the moment, the first thing that came to mind was the possibility that my pins had moved. I mean, something bizarre had foiled such an easy shot. Now I'll be the first to admit, I'm no Robin Hood of the woods. I've made bad shots on elk before, but in all my 23 seasons of hunting elk with a bow, I'd never missed one entirely like that. Well, except for once actually when a mechanical component of my bow caused the miss. And I'm going to say right now that that needs to be the next essay I write and record because that story of my very first elk calling encounter is worth sharing. But at the moment, I had to assume the miss on this Royal Crown Bull was due to my sight pins. I've been dogging them, but my leg is cramping up. So I'm going to have to let him go wait for this storm to settle and see what happens but I don't know I'm worried my pins might have moved or something because I had a chance to watch a whole string of cows go by in front of them and so I was really sure on the yardage and my arrow just went right underneath him I couldn't believe it so pretty pretty frustrating epic epic scenario here though with this storm coming through all this thunder and lightning and rain and hail Elk were still filing past me at a hundred or so yards out as stragglers of the herd made their way down to where the group had slowed. Thunder still filled the air, but without the startling effect it had previously thrashed us with. It was calm enough now to notice the sound of massive marble-sized drops falling from the trees and landing like water balloons with a splash. I kept my eyes on the elk that were still visible letting them pass before making any moves to stand, stretch, and consider my options. First thing I had to do was shoot my bow to understand if it or its sights were amiss. I went into this season with only four premium shooter arrows, one subprime practice arrow, and a standard issue grouse arrow. But now, with my shot at the Royal Crown Bowl, my number one and best shooting arrow was long gone. 
looking at a quiver compromised in this way is not exactly confidence inspiring. Behind me was a grassy wallow area, and I pulled out my rangefinder to identify a lush hummock of grass about 30 yards. I plucked my subprime practice arrow from its slot and knocked it on my string. Pulling my bow to full draw, I contemplated this moment of truth. If my pins were indeed somehow bumped from position, which easily could happen in the course of hunting, or if they and everything else with my bow was true, and what this would mean for the analysis of my miss. I steadied my aim on the clump of grass and watched with a slanted expression as my arrow drilled the target precisely. Well, that's certainly a relief that at least I don't have to worry about my bow, I said to myself, walking up to retrieve my arrow. Bending over, I studied where it had landed relative to my aim and confirmed the accuracy of this practice shot. Pulling the shaft from the grass, I blurted out a muffled, God damn it, as the shaft emerged with a shattered end minus my broadhead and half its length. I looked back at my quiver now in total disgust. Three prime arrows and a practically useless claw-tipped grouse arrow were all that remained. Another powerful bugle interrupted my self-loathing pity party, and I turned to look down the slope. It sounded reasonably close, given that I'd pretty much paused my effort on the herd. Only a few minutes had lapsed since I'd watched the last of the few cows slip from view, and I quickly triangulated where the bugle came from with where I'd seen the caboose of the herd headed. I stabbed the broken shaft of my arrow back into the grass, set my gaze towards the new heading, and staggered downhill, limping in a straight-legged gimp to accommodate my nagging cramp. It only took a few hundred yards before I had elk in sight once again, and as I'd hoped, the herd had settled from its runaway freight train descent off the ridgeline and were now finding themselves calmed down and milling about. Calculating a large loop, I hooked side hill in a large arc and approached the very front group of cows. Rain continued to fall in a soaking mist, compounded by the large droplets that accumulated in the tree branches and fell like melons. After napping in the warm sun prior to the storm, and spectating that tempest as it approached, I'd contemplated donning my raincoat. But as the urgency of that opportunity developed, I found myself in hot pursuit of these elk, and I opted to dive into the storm and continue as I was, with merely a cotton t-shirt and a hooded wool long sleeve. But now, as adrenaline had receded and the tempo of this stock slowed, I found myself soaking wet and deemed a rain layer would be useless at this point. However, a short time later, as I crept into bow range of the leading group of cows, I found myself pinned behind the profile of a large tree trunk as cold rainwater drenched me to the skin. I longed for the layers of warmth stowed just inches from my body and my backpack, yet out of reach and a world away as I remained still to avoid being detected. Controlling shivers became an issue. Elk were mingling all around me, nibbling on various grass and leafy treats. I stood like a scarecrow nailed to the trunk of this centuries-old fir tree. The weight of my backpack pushed relentlessly on my knotted and aching neck and shoulder. I swore I could feel the weight adding up from each raindrop that landed on my backpack, pushing harder and harder, stamping my feet into the ground like stakes. At least I'm still standing and no longer fighting my cramp and quads, I told myself. But if you've ever been in this situation, you know. It can really suck to be inside a herd of animals and trying to stay undetected. An inch of movement can become a priceless luxury. Half an hour had passed and I was nearly regretting the fact that I'd successfully positioned myself right where I'd been trying to get since this pursuit began. I had shot opportunities available on several cows, but the royal crown bull, as I'd now settled on calling him, was nowhere to be seen. I was frustrated, because initially as I tracked the herd, he'd been running at the front of the group while I dogged the back. Now I'd made this deliberate leapfrog to get in front, and he'd fallen behind to the back. Minutes passed like hours, and all I could see were cows. Soaking wet cows, that I watched enviously as they shook excess water from their coats like a lab emerging from the river on a hot July day. They stretched, yawned, and chewed their cud as carelessly as could be. 
while I stood rigid like a crumbling statue, full of aching pains and trying to contain a quickening pace of shivers. It was plain that I was going to be here for a while, as the bull was nowhere to be seen, and from a fair distance I could observe any elk that wandered in my direction. My mind returned to the ridge and the howling wind tunnel in the trees I'd shot through. If it wasn't my bow, then how the hell did I miss so bad? The next conclusion following my pins moving was that, indeed, the wind. I'd never really considered compensating for a shot for vertical windage. But as I re-examined the circumstances, I came to realize that was exactly what had happened. My shot was at a steep downhill angle, and as the wind was gusting down and head on, it all made perfect sense now. That my arrow had literally been pushed down, like your hand out the car window when tipped just slightly. Once that fierce wind nudged the point of my broadhead off course, its trajectory was exponentially doomed with each yard it traveled. I recalled the gust as I was taking aim and how I had to lift my bow to get my pins back up on the bull's midsection. Watching my arrow fall so far below the target replayed over and over in my head. I came to grips with the fact that I'd missed because of my failure to compensate for such a strong headwind. But it all happened so fast, I didn't necessarily feel like I'd made a mistake, although it was certainly something I'd learned from. It's simply a risk of shooting at a moving target through a small window. The shot was reflex, with timing entirely out of my control. I was eternally grateful that I missed him altogether, and didn't miss him in the guts. A 30-yard broadside shot is not normally rocket science, but in this case, all the clues I was adding together were forming an analogy that felt very much like exactly that, rocket science. And I imagine the searing heat of rocket thrust trying to keep my teeth from chattering. Looking back now at my GPS data, from the time I engaged the elk on the ridge to where I stood at the moment, the temperature had dropped 22 degrees. Water dripped down the inside of my legs. Royal Crown was nowhere to be seen. The situation was tough, but I was not at all deterred by the fact I'd missed. I was still hunting this bull. And every moment presented new opportunities for me to find success, and what had already transpired really didn't matter at all. Every moment of a hunt is an opportunity, as long as you're willing to stay in the game. When the atmosphere around me finally did shift and swirl, it was a yearling cow who bedded down 40 or so yards below me that first caught danger on the wind. She was not even the elk closest to me, even in that direction, so I was impressed to see her nose the first one to begin the telltale bouncing, scooping motions of alarm. By this point, I was actually relieved the encounter was over. Between shivering from the cold and cramps in my shoulder and legs, I was physically and mentally beyond the limits of where I'd like to continue such a high-stakes venture. I was ready to call it off at this point and let everything reset. It took what felt like forever for all the elk to get out of my hair. It was driving me crazy as I so desperately needed to move to get the pack off of my back and warm up. But it was also important not to spook the elk any harder than necessary, so I remained perfectly still. Finally, maybe five minutes later, the last of the elk had sprinted past me and regrouped in the main herd, which of course returned to the area where the bull had remained the whole time. Along with this commotion came the expected resumption of bugling as the community discussed what was going on and what to do next. I was surprised to note that besides a single spike, Crown Point was the only bull. This is exceptionally strange to me for a herd of 30 to 40 elk to have only two bulls, much less only a single branch antlered bull. Even as Crown Point bugled, all the mountains around were silent. Not a peep from any ranging satellite bulls, as I would certainly bet should have been present, and responding to this invitation for dialogue. The sunshine felt like a warm blanket, and along with my steady tempo marching uphill, getting my blood pumping again, life returned to my body and soul. The storm had passed, and the sky was beginning to look like nothing had happened at all. A herd of elk were moving on to their next location, sending updates along the way as I listened to Royal Crown light up the mountain air. And then another sound stopped me in my tracks. I imagined it stopped every one of the elk in their tracks too. Wolves. 
Apparently the temptation was too great, and following all the ruckus, the controversial predators made their first announcement since I'd been in this new area. I stood with my eyes closed and listened hard to the various voices of the pack harmonizing within their chorus. A smile bent my lips. Then something remarkable happened. Contrary to all the anti-wolf propaganda I've ever encountered, Royal Crown fired back at the wolves with a defiant bugle. I wanted to bugle back at the wolves too, and howl with them. Hey there folks, this is Brian Husky in chapter 3 of my 2019 archery hunting essay. I'm jumping back in time a little bit with this chapter, reflecting on the circumstances that led me to the mountains where chapters 1 and 2 took place. So it's a bit of a skipping around in the timeline, but it'll all tie back together with where we left off in chapter two. So here we are with chapter three, High in the Mountains. Dry hole cost. It's a phrase that a wonderful and influential old timer in my life named Jack introduced me to. How much I'm willing to invest in any given venture before pulling the plug, as Jack described it. It was a term often used by oil drilling outfits, considering how long to drill before pulling out and trying someplace else. I contemplated various angles of this question when last December's elk hunting daydreams pressed me. Just where were my new daydreams going to take place? Should I stick with the zone I'd hunted the last two seasons? The area had more than enough elk, but hunting pressure was clearly trending in the wrong direction. I mean, how long was I willing to gamble each time I rounded that final corner to reveal a quiet, unoccupied parking area or a dozen rigs? Man, I can feel the tension of that moment in my guts just writing and talking about it now. I never had any direct conflict or issues with the other hunters sharing the woods together. It just didn't feel wild to me in the sense that I seek out wildness. I like to think I could step over a log and find something that no modern person has ever seen. It's like walking a trail versus cross country, camping in a campground versus undeveloped. I mean, for the most part, you're never going to find something incredible in one of those developed situations. And when I'm out in the boonies, I just want to be alone, undisturbed, uninterrupted. Heck, I'll take a place with one single elk and no people versus a place with thousands of elk pursued by handfuls of hunters. My hunt is, after all, not for elk. It's for satisfaction and quality of experience. It's the pride of accomplishment and the dodgy reward of more than breaking even on a big gamble. And these things are all bolstered by pulling them together from scratch. It's like scratch hunting in the sense of putting my own fingerprints on every ingredient of the final product. From the mouse click scouring maps and Google Earth, to the summertime scouting trips, to the yays or nays of what's found along the way, all the way to picking up my bow under the dimming stars of opening morning. These are all elements that I love about being a do-it-yourself solo hunter, and each element has added tremendously to my past experiences. Opportunities to talk with several of the newcomers last season gave way to understanding of why the strange uptick in hunting pressure occurred. The folks I talked to described how they had each reached out to fish and game biologists in the region who directed them to this particular area. It was a reality that I could understand, although I found incredibly unlucky given that I'd been there for one season in that spot with almost no other people or vehicles encountered before it turned into something of a zoo. It's true that the area had an incredibly healthy population of elk and quite frankly was underutilized by hunters, so the recommendations totally made sense. I accepted the circumstance and reluctantly, once again, let go. And so ultimately for 2019, I decided to pull all my chips, a fortune in first-hand experience and wealth of bull elk numbers, from this great known spot to gamble somewhere else. Yet I had no idea where that somewhere else would be. It was foolish by any angle for me to bail on the zone that I'd been hunting with so much success over the past years. I mean, all told, I discovered over a dozen fantastic places to hunt over my 18 years of hunting in Idaho. Yet I felt forced to leave nearly all of those places because of gobs of people showing up. 
So the early months of 2019 found me pondering where to go next. And by July, the honing process was well underway. Places I'd explored on Google seemed like sure things. I took extensive measures reaching deep into the backcountry. From my computer screen, I'd venture miles up dirt roads, more miles up single track trails, more miles cross country, up thousands of feet of rugged ridges to what I would have guessed would be elk nirvana. And when I got there in person, I found nothing. They sucked. There were strange observations along the way. Well-established and beat-down game trails without any tracks. Old bleached rubs, but none from recent years. Zero sign, old or new. Not even old crumbly white elk shit could be found. And then I found it. Fresh tracks from a pack of wolves. I was sincerely perplexed. How was it possible for such incredible habitat to be totally void of elk? I mean, yes, there were a handful of elk. Reaching the mountaintop meadow where I'd actually spotted herds of elk on Google Earth, I did indeed find a group of cows. And that's where the wolf sign was. But the fact that in all these miles of getting there, passing through what I'd absolutely call perfect habitat, I didn't see a scrap of sign was troubling to say the least. I was at a total loss for explanation. During the epic 12-hour trek, I kept repeating in my head that it seemed shameful to be in such incredible habitat that was totally vacant of critters. Maybe the wolves really had knocked the shit out of the elk in these areas. Maybe I'd just been lucky that in all my previous seasons of hunting in Idaho, the wolves had just not yet taken their toll on the respective herds that I was sharing with them. I pondered a slice of humble pie, sincerely considering if I'd been wrong all along in dismissing the anti-wolf community as simply ignorant haters. During this period in late August, I almost caved. I considered returning somewhere that I knew there were elk, albeit a grip of hunting competitors too. This initial scouting trip had left me skeptical in my decision to relocate. My second venture into promising looking elk areas left me flat out depressed with the lack of elk sign, much less actual elk. But the thought of seeing headlights appear in the valley below me as I packed my bag and departed my camp one more time scared me straight. The memories of ATV motors rumbling in the distance triggered a gag reflex. I couldn't go back to where I'd been hunting. My resolve was locked, and pulling up stakes is something I'm all too familiar with. Plus, I've always described how hunting season is the time of year when I can really get out and explore this great state I call home. It's when I can find interesting places, variations of landscapes, transitions of vegetation, get new soil under my fingernails, and come to know more of Idaho. Sure, I could have almost 20 years of experience if I'd been hunting the same place at this point, and have the elk patterned and understood so well I'd practically be shopping the aisles of a familiar grocery store each season. While there is great appeal in knowing how to hunt an area that well, I do what's ironically least productive for my hunting success. I seem to move every time I really get a spot figured out. But I do feel like I'm searching for something, and one of these years, I'll find a place that I can call the spot. A place so great, I'll deem it the best, and look ahead to taking my kid or kids there when they are old enough. That is, I suppose, what I'm ultimately searching for, I think. So the archery season of 2019 did indeed find me packed into a whole new area for my elk hunt. I'd loaded my pack with tent, sleeping bag, and pad, my small burner stove, food and water, and all the fixings of a backcountry spike camp. I was excited for lodging in the midst of elk I would be hunting. Getting an especially heavy load up to the elevation where I'd hoped to camp was a great and worthwhile effort. What a joy to be sitting at my camp, glassing the surrounding canyons as the sun set a time that I'd often be commuting back to camp somewhere I'd parked my truck. Elk began to bugle as soon as darkness fell, and by 2 a.m. I'd still yet to fall asleep. I was simply too excited. I'd begin to doze off, but a distant elk sound would trickle into my tent and I'd pop up wide awake like I'd been slapped in the face. By early morning, a storm began raging outside, and sheets of rain pelted and lashed at the rainfly. 
The rain seemed to surge over my camp in waves, like an exposed rock along an ocean beach. Wind and rain would engulf my tent for a few moments and then recede to quiet. During these quiet periods, I could hear elk, apparently unbothered by this weather. Each time the storm would pause, I'd listen hard and hope the storm would pass. But each time the rain would return and I'd cuss the disruption of getting to listen to the elk and imagining what was going on. Then I'd also hope that the final push had rain and passed and it would start to calm and dry off outside. I certainly was not hoping to spend my day hunting in the pouring rain and returning to sleep in a soggy sleeping bag. But no such luck. It was after two when I'd checked my watch last, but I did eventually doze off to sleep. By 5.45 in the morning, heavy rain woke me up again, and I simply gave up on sleeping. Very much to my surprise, the elk were still partying outside despite this weather that felt appropriate more for the Oregon coast than this Idaho high country. I sat upright in my sleeping bag, getting fully dressed, packed, and ready to roll, listening to all the manners of the elk socializing. I heard bugles from several bulls, some mature and some very immature sounding. I heard cows chatting, bickering, and meowing. I heard hoofbeats of a group that wandered close enough downwind of my tent to get my wind and spook. It sounded like an absolute circus of elk activity was taking place just behind the millimeter or two of coated nylon layers of my tent. With so much time to spare, I took the rare luxury of actually cooking breakfast. Sitting in my tent in the dark and out of the rain, I arranged my tiny burner just outside the tent door and fixed up a triple helping of oatmeal. I was in a hurry to get the burner turned off so I could hear as much as possible and calculate where the elk sounds were coming from and just what it sounded like they were up to. I pulled the zipper quietly and eventually made my way out of the tent just to stand and stare into the fuzzy gray atmosphere, listening to the raindrops pelt off of my jacket and tent while elk verbalized close enough I was sure they were within view if only daylight would quit dragging its feet and just arrive already. It felt like forever for the clock to move and the slightest hint of light to stay in the eastern horizon. The thick clouds and fog of the storm delayed early light of morning even further. But finally, morning reached a state where my eyes could see the geometric seams, the zippers, and poles of my tent without any of the lights turned on. I stood next to my tent, spooning bites of hot oatmeal, and watching the sky begin to reveal blotchy details of rain-swollen clouds, mixing with the faint lightness of morning like the first few stirs of separated yogurt. The rain let up. It was so great now to listen freely. It was wild and crazy to literally be knocking an arrow before taking a single step from camp. But as the light began to reveal the world around me, I got after it, swinging around to the downwind side of the majority of the elk I was listening to. That first morning's hunt was a dandy and set the tone for what much of my time in this area would be like from elk camp. What a dream! And far enough off the beaten path, deep enough into the woods, high enough into the mountains, that the scourge of ATVs could not spoil my fun, nor even enter my mind, which in itself is a priceless feature of any place. Throughout the season, my four trips packing into this spike camp, I was delighted with elk encounters that left lasting memories. And I was introduced to many bulls I came to know by name. Big bulls largest of which was a clean 6x6 that easily topped 350-inch measure. I spotted him one morning after trekking a solid 10 yards from camp and looking into the bowl-shaped fork of a major canyon. It was gray enough in the pre-dawn light that I nearly blurted out loud when I spotted him and his eight or so cows. Given that I was more or less blinking the sleep out of my eyes and just admiring the glow of sunrise developing over the mountain range to the east, I'd been hearing bugling in the system of canyons below and just getting a feel for where the respective bugles were coming from. I was startled to hear some sounds just below me and looked down to see this string of elk only 150 yards away. At first glance, as dark as it still was, I had no idea how big he was. 
but I saw where the herd was headed and made haste to drop into the bowl, which I came to call the toilet bowl. There were several springs that flowed from an open slope, maybe four or 500 yards from camp. I scurried down a primary game trail to intercept the group and had closed the gap to just over 100 yards from the elk. Reading terrain and anticipating wind currents is a vital component of archery hunting and to some degree can make or break shot opportunities. A steady breeze was in my face. However, the falling thermals of early morning mixed which direction could be considered safe. This was all compounded by the circular bowl shape of the topography, which led to a general counterclockwise swirl of scent within the half-mile bowl. Hence the name Toilet Bowl. I watched in disgust as the cows began to lift their noses into the air, learning of my presence and sounding the alarm to flee the area. The cows lined out and ran, with the bull in tow. I watched in amazement as I came to realize just how huge this bull indeed was, given that when I initially spotted him, I guessed him to be a nice, but not a huge bull. I pulled my camera from my pack and took some video of this magnum as he bugled and casually followed the group of cows he was obligated to follow, even though he never actually caught my wind himself. The next day found me settled near a spring a few miles from camp. It was mid-afternoon and a host of physical ailments prompted me to take a break from covering ground. I'd picked out a perfect blind location, centered inside a cluster of trees with perfect shooting lanes into the grassing meadow, which a cold spring-fed water seeped from. My pack served as a perfect reclining pillow, and following an hour or so in this position, I dozed off to sleep. Dreams were beginning to take over my thoughts when I was startled back to consciousness by the sound of a blue grouse flushing. My thoughts instantly recalled earlier in that day when I'd observed a group of elk flush grouse, something that I'd pondered and taken note of, previously wondering if grouse held or flushed by passing animals that they knew were not a threat to them. So as the grouse woke me from my nap, something's coming was the first thing that ran through my head and knowing now what I'd just seen, that it could indeed be elk. I sat up and repositioned myself over my bow that was leaning against the tree next to me. Sure enough, within moments, a cow elk rose into view from below where I'd heard the grouse flush. She and two others eventually made their way up to my location, browsing along and just doing their thing. I was filled with hope that a bull accompanied the group, but one never appeared. The cows actually bedded down in the grass just across from my location. Not wanting to shoot a cow yet at this point in the season, I enjoyed their company as live decoys if nothing else, hoping a bull would join them. I'm sure there was a bull somewhere in the area, but he never emerged. I was grateful for the learning opportunity though, and this new awareness to listen for the sound of grouse as indicators of approaching critters. So what about those wolves I mentioned at the end of chapter two? I have come to form a hypothesis on the subject for what it's worth, and I feel pretty confident in my findings. Without taking the time to do any research or get exact timelines, I'm gonna throw some approximate numbers out here. So keep that in mind. But my brief history of wolves in Idaho goes something like this. Let's say approximately 20 some years ago, wolf reintroduction began in parts of Idaho. Over the following years, these wolves did indeed annihilate elk herds. The elk of the day had no idea how to survive around these new, high-performance predators that were suddenly introduced to their world out of nowhere, and their numbers tanked. I'm going to make another approximation here that on average, let's say elk live 7 to 10 years or so. So that first generation of elk really did take it in the shorts. Fast forward to where we are today, though, and the elk herds have had a few generations before them to kind of get things sorted out, to evolve an understanding of what to expect and how to live around wolves. I think that the elk of today are better equipped to coexist with wolves than the population of elk that first had wolves introduced to their world. I know I've made my position pretty obvious that I'm not a wolf hater, and I'm sure I've pissed some people off with remarks of how I viewed those who are wolf haters. So, in full disclosure for the record, I personally have no interest in hunting wolves at this time. 
I think that they are an added part of a wild experience in the outdoors. For me, they bring a new component that feels pretty rad. But it's totally true that I have a hardcore predator hunting background. I'm immensely proud of my predator calling and hunting skills that I developed as a small child along with fur trapping with my father. So I'm no weenie who doesn't have the stomach for that kind of hunting. I've just personally grown out of it at this time in my life. However, if at some point I find a need to participate in wolf management, you bet, I'd certainly consider carrying a wolf tag. I'm just not convinced it's the dire situation that some would suggest, at least not in the dozen or more locations where I've extensively hunted to date, from Riggins all the way to Arco. And what I so often see represented as part of the anti-wolf movement is just ignorance, coming from so-called sportsmen and women that I question, that don't quite impress me as anybody I could frankly admire. Smoke a pack a day, save a hundred elk, shoot a wolf, those are simply emotionally driven hot-button propaganda whistles in my book and appeal to the most shallow understandings of what big picture nature and wild ecosystems are all about. Flip the coin and I also see glaring faults in what so much of the pro-wolf advocates are made up of, in the sense of gathering a bunch of purely anti-hunting activists to band together and bolster wolf advocacy is silly and entirely faulty. I find it equally hard to trust that reasonable perspectives on wolf management can come from those who harbor extreme anti-hunting views. That just does not work. A kill em all wolf hater and save every poor animal wolf advocate simply do not bring value to the discussion, not in my opinion. Just as the extreme fringes of our political world bring 10 times more harm than benefit to the conversation, while independents in the center long for a civil dialogue and a better life for all. I mean, that's what I want, a better experience for all, elk and wolves. I've always thought it could happen, and from what I've seen over almost two decades hunting in Idaho, the critters are sorting things out, and finding that balance. So following my season hunting in an area renowned for being overrun with wolves, my takeaway is that the elk numbers are rebounding. From the longest lasting form of elk sign, that'd be rubs, it was evident to me that in this area, there were more elk present this year than last. I saw far more fresh from this year rubs than all of the past one, two, three year old aged rubs combined. And I listened with my own two ears as bull elk bugled back at a pack of howling wolves. And to that topic, I observed elk rutting behavior as good as any I've encountered at any time in any part of the state. The elk were not silent where I was at, and wolves were present. Just has been the case in every other place I've hunted so far in Idaho. I can totally buy into some level of impact, of rutting disruption over those first generations that encountered wolves. But I think the elk, and nature as a whole, knows what it's doing. And paired with hunting as a carefully managed tool, everything's going to be okay. Over the following days and trips to my toilet bowl, well, actually I should call it the punch bowl spike camp, I never saw that huge six point again. Although I stayed busy engaging different bulls in their harems of cows on a regular basis, I never encountered mule deer like I'd hoped to find at this high elevation paradise, due in part, I suppose, to the especially tough winters of late. It's ideal looking big buck habitat, and I'd expect that with time, they'll repopulate eventually. I didn't ever lay eyes on the mountain goats either, although I did see goat tracks and sign on a regular basis. I did enjoy the surprise of a lone bighorn ram appearing above camp one night, something I was incredibly surprised, delighted even to see up here in my new favorite place, my happy place, high in the mountains. Until next time, thanks for listening. And coming along. Coming up in chapter four, we'll head back to the Punch Bowl camp as I bring my good buddy Ian along for what will be my last trip of the season. I hope you'll join us. Okay, howdy folks. This is Brian Husky here with chapter four of this uh, 2019 archery elk season. And uh, hey, just wanted to say thank you to the folks that have uh, sent uh, emails or texts or whatever. Um, letting me know they enjoy hearing about this stuff. That means a lot to me, and it's definitely a driver for me to keep doing uh, what I'm doing and telling these stories and sharing them with, uh, with the audience out there that likes hearing them. So thank you for that. 
And uh, yeah, here we go. Off to chapter four. Uh, this is called Reckless Precision. It was September 24th now, the final full day of my final trip of the season. I was well aware of the circumstance that this would be my last opportunity for archery success in 2019. Looking back, I realized I'd been in the same position two years prior, just before taking my best bull. And that's described in the uh, Skylines episodes, uh, the 2017 rut reports. Although at the moment, that specific recollection did not occur to me. My dear friend Ian had joined me for this trip, and the two of us had split up earlier in the morning. From a ridge top, we had each pointed in different directions at the sounds of bugling elk, and we agreed we would investigate our respective leads individually. I dropped into a panel of timber I referred to as the storm front, where a great sounding bugle had earlier boomed out of. A few minutes into my descent, I had a good bearing on where I thought the bull was located and a powerful bugle followed by a sequence of chuckles confirmed that I was getting close. I slowed my pace to 90% creep and set my eyes to 100% scan as I carefully stepped my way through the thick timber and downfall. Minutes later, I'd advanced 100 or so yards and like an airliner coming in for landing, lowering its flaps and landing gear, I reduced my speed even more and knocked an arrow and I bumped my eyes to 200% scan. My movement now resembled the pace of honey pouring from the freezer, and I paused at the slightest clues to analyze where I could expect to land my eyes on elk. The wind here on this panel of timber I refer to as the storm front had proven as reliable as anywhere I'd hunted. Over the course of the season, I'd hunted this south-facing slope five times previously, and each of those times, the wind had been a steady push from south to north. The previous razor-close encounters I'd had with large herd bulls in other locations were all foiled by swirling scent, and I'd long ago come to accept that I could never beat the wind. A new perspective and attitude, however, had convinced me that there was a way I could beat the wind, and it was by the numbers. Although the wind dominates outcomes at will, I told myself the wind couldn't screw me over every single time, and if I kept putting myself in situations where I could shoot an elk, eventually, by the numbers, I could sneak one by when the wind wasn't paying attention. This mantra was running through my head when the thumping of hoofbeats stopped me in my tracks. There's no way, I said to myself. I could feel that the wind had been pushing up against my face this entire approach and I refused to consider that I was hearing elk spooking away from me. The burst of noise was brief, just a few trotting thumps, and in fact it helped guide me to its source location. Another 20 or so yards later, I halted again as my eyes caught the flicker of movement in the layers of fir and white pine trees ahead. I could make out a single cow elk, calm in demeanor and facing uphill towards me. She was maybe 80 yards away. A powerful bugle startled me, and I purred at the potential this scenario was shaping into. Behind the cow, the shape of another elk advanced into view, first just a nose, but above the nose curled brow tines of a big, mature herd bull. The bull gradually slid into view, revealing himself little by little. As more of them became visible, I begged for it to be the royal crown 7x7 I'd missed two trips prior. Like watching the outcome of a slot machine from left to right, the first two windows were giving me what I hoped for. Big bull. Antler points G1, G2, G3. Finally, he stepped far enough forward that I could see his entire rack. A bold 6x6 emerged minus the stunning crown points of the bull I was hoping that he was. All the same, it was hardly an actual disappointment. This bull was big, the same class size as Royal Crown 7x7, and moreover, he was right in front of me, like the cow, 80 or so yards below, although it may as well have been a mile, since the trees were so thick there was zero chance of a shot presently. But this situation was already golden. Several factors pumped my confidence. First off, the wind was steady, and I was as sure as I could be that it would remain that way. 
Second, I was already almost within range, confident in my shooting up to the mid 60 yards or so. Third, off to my right were multiple openings that could serve as shooting lanes if the elk passed through them. Straight ahead and to my left was less promising. A single lane extended out to maybe 50 yards, but it was very, very narrow and had a sprawl of dead branches above it that could be problematic in allowing the arc of a longer distance shot. Right in front of me was a pretty open lane, although it only worked from about 10 to 20 yards deep, and it had a large tree trunk right in the middle of it. Fourth factor was there appeared to be only these two elk. The rest of the herd could be heard milling about much further down below us, along with another bull whose bugle was slight and fluty. From the air, I could imagine that this herd was dispersed among this timbered slope, with the herd bull and his cow at the far uphill perimeter. And that's exactly where I stood. Now the final factor I enjoyed was that these two elk were pointed my way, making it possible, if not likely, that they would continue in my direction. And, I hoped, pass to my right where I'd have a clear shot at either one of them. Either one of them. Yeah. That was one thing I was wrestling with in my head. The fact that given this was indeed my last hunt on my last day, and I would take any elk at this point, even this cow. The thought of shooting a cow with a herd bull right behind her was uncomfortable to say the least. Not unacceptable, but certainly made me squirm. I mean, I'd made so many gambles this far on the season, and faced with the ticking clock and the risk of going home empty-handed and eating tag soup, I'd accepted that I would shoot any elk I could, which meant passing a clear shot on this cow would be yet another gamble that I did not plan to make, assuming she presented one before the bull, which was highly likely given that he was following her. And so I confirmed, as hard as it was, that I was going to take a shot at this cow if it developed. A cow, after all, is better than a skunk. From where I stood, I could only make out small patches of each animal. I could see a foot here, an antler tip there, ears flickering and such. I studied the ground ahead of me intently. When considering shooting lanes and opportunities, inches matter and decisions are based on variables that are just too hard to guess. If I try and advance to step towards the elk, I'll only lose this shooting lane in front of me and then I might have to go about 10 yards before it looks like there might be another opportunity for shooting lanes over here and there. Yeah, staying put, I knew I had this one micro lane at my 12 o'clock and several more at my two and three and four o'clock positions. If I tried to move closer, I'd be forfeiting the lanes that I had with only a hope of other lanes at all. I felt like a chess player studying the board and imagining possible outcomes of moves two and three four moves later following that my eyes were not convincing me that better positions were feasible the twig snapped under my boot it felt the size of a toothpick and simply shifting my weight caused its crisp report ears perked to attention and the gaze of both the bull and the cow locked on my direction there is no way i am moving i said to myself Fortunately, the bull was far more interested in the cow than any tiny squirrel-sized sounds trickling through the woods. He pushed up closer to her now, invading her space and prompting her to trot a few strides uphill. And yes, closer to me. His disruption overrode the tiny sound that I'd made, and both elk resumed at ease activities. At this point, the cow was advancing closer to me in the shooting window at my 12 o'clock. She was around 30 yards at this point, and just to the right of the narrow open space. But both elk were clearly on leisure time. No rush to move or to do anything besides just stand there, sniff the air around them. Blocks of five, even ten minutes passed with the elk just standing there. None of this really bothered me. I have the patience of a granite boulder when in the company of elk. But aches and pains in my body were marking time by the second. Other than shifting weight from one foot to another, I had not moved now for over half an hour. Just for fun, try standing perfectly still for half an hour sometime. It sounds easy, and at times it is. But in full disclosure, I carried with me this pesky ailment 
This jacked up back and shoulder that Jay Peterman from Seinfeld so eloquently described as one gargantuan monkey fist. This fist of knotted rhomboid muscle had been haunting me since back in August. At home, I could deal with it. A quick internet search of the condition described extended computer desk work, rowing, overhand tennis serving, and heavy backpack use as primary triggers. Check, 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 and check. All season long, I'd been walking around the woods with my right elbow up in the air, hand gripping the center loop of my backpack. This was the only position I could temporarily relieve the knotted, cramping pain that accompanied every minute I wore my heavy hunting pack. For each mile upon mile I'd covered all season, this was my default form. Never comfortable, but the back and forth pattern I followed would usually keep my whining groans at bay. That and a lot of ibuprofen and Tylenol. But now, besides holding my bow vertically with the arrow knocked right in front of me, the dull, tightening Charlie horse in my neck and shoulder was consuming my body, my posture, my form, and my focus. I was beginning to sink beneath the weight of my pack, sagging and compressing like melting ice sculpture in the sun. I needed to stretch. I needed to get this pack off my back. I just needed to move. All these distractions were going through my head as the bull and cow continued their dance, their romance as nature would have it. He was courting her after all. And once again, he made another advance charging up behind her, testing if the moment was right. But once again, the cow trotted ahead, preventing the bull from getting a chance to mount. This latest surge pushed both her and the bull right through my only shooting window at a rate and angle I didn't even consider attempting a shot. They were now both past my 12 o'clock shooting lane, safe in the thick tangle of trees that filled everything from my 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Yet they were even closer than ever, each within 30 yards of where I stood. But again, it may as well have been a mile. And to make matters worse, they were both now pointed squarely to my left, meaning that any continued steps would be away from me now at this point, and away from any chance at a shot and easily gone forever. The silver lining of all this was that I now felt I could safely and very slowly squat to the ground and remove that groaning weight of my pack from my shoulders. Doing so provided little relief, but at least the weight was gone, and I took time sitting on my heels to recompose my focus. This was fortunate, as the bull had seemed to sense my activity, and as I was in the process of rising back up to my feet, I was able to spot a tiny few inches of his outline through the tree branches, and he appeared deadlocked on me. Fifteen or so minutes later, his fixation on my location had eased as the satellite bull from the rest of the herd I'd almost forgotten about sounded off a bugle. As king of the woods, the bull before me fired back as if to squash any doubt that he was still right here, just outside the orbit of the main herd and present to any challenge of his dominance. This exchange tempted me to enter the conversation. Able to slowly rise to my feet, I stood tall and enjoyed the opportunity to roll my shoulders and slowly rock my head fore and aft, side to side. I felt the shape of diaphragm calls in my pocket and contemplated putting one to use. It's interesting to take note of how much elk like to hear noises. While spending this time so close to these elk, I noticed that any time either the bull or the cow would make a significant noise, a hoof clunk, branch break, rock roll, or whatever, the satellite bull below us would bugle at the sound. Likewise, any slight commotion below us would initiate a vocal response from the big bull. Elk hear everything. At one point, I shifted my weight, and for the second time, I swear it was nothing more than a few pine needles softly breaking under my foot. It was barely even audible to me. The reaction and ear direction from both elk snapped to attention and scanned for the source of the sound. I don't think many hunters realize how much animals can hear. And as annoying as they can be, I count pine squirrels as the archer's best friend, given how much noise and racket they make, and how often elk must write off audits of sound to their noisy neighbors. I'm so close, 
crazy close. If I were to either bugle or cow call at this range, the bull would have to investigate, right? He would close the short gap between us to confirm if I was a willing cow or a rival bull. In doing so, possibly step through a shooting lane. Or he and the cow would bolt and all opportunity would be lost. I weighed the possibilities of making a move versus sitting tight. Back and forth I debated. I had been in this very scenario a week prior with a big herd bull I named Houdini for his trickiness and seemingly magical ability to throw his voice and eluded me several times when I thought I had him all figured out. I recalled the first time I was within his herd. The wind was right and I'd made my way to within 60 or so yards of him and his cows. We'd been exchanging bugles leading up to that point, so it was clear that I was posing as a rival bull, challenging him for his harem of booty. The ploy had been working up to that point, but I was pinned in a position where I could see several cows and I could move no closer myself. I needed Houdini to close the remaining gap for me to have a shot. Eventually, when I could see him looping my direction in his circuit of the herd, I poked at him with a bugle in an attempt to insult him to become a pestering bother that he needed to squash once and for all. It's a play that every seasoned elk hunter knows, and it's a gamble. A herd bull has to be in just the right mood, a fighting mood for this kind of proposition to work. Most times it does not. Houdini scoffed at my insult and turned back to his cows, herding them up and out of their beds and off to quieter pastures. So here I was again, pinned in position with no chance of moving, and a huge herd bull so very close, yet so far. I didn't want to call, and I found it highly unlikely the elk would reverse direction and move towards me at this point. I needed something to happen, to turn the elk around them and move them back closer to me. I needed something to stir the pot. Sometimes when you're in the woods, you hear sounds that you dread. Sometimes you hear sounds that bring elation. When it's very quiet, so quiet you can hear squirrels dropping pine cones from far distances or the buzz of bee wings meters away our imagination can play tricks on us taunting with hints of things we desperately want to hear or haunting with threats of sounds we despise there's a period of time moments when sounds are in transit from our ears to our brain that are pregnant with possibilities what am i hearing it sounds like it could be rocks crunching or wheels rolling, propeller blades thumping the air or ATV exhaust or hooves beating the ground. Seconds drag out in prolonged analysis. The brain measures data and offers ideas. I was hearing something. It was getting louder and it was coming up behind me and fast. The pot was about to be stirred. By the time my brain processed what I was hearing, the sounds came to a clunking halt. Hoofbeats. A few more cloven hooves clicked to a stop. Some rocks tumbled down the hill. I turned my head 180 degrees to look over my right shoulder, and I saw a group of cow elk staring at me. I was nearly in the primary pathway they likely wished to follow through the tangle of trees and downfall. Four or five cows were looking over each other's shoulders, wondering why the lead cow had stopped. A handful more idled in from behind and moseyed around the outside. The group of them were about 30 yards from where I stood. 30 yards exactly opposite of me is where the bull and single cow were posted up. I was smack between the groups. With all this commotion, the bull, of course, welcomed the arrival of these fine ladies and greeted the group with a hefty bugle. Clearly seeing and hearing the bull, the group resumed their entry and sauntered onward, coming to a stop five to ten yards directly below me. However, the lead cow was still acting wary, no doubt reassured by the presence of the bull, but also visibly concerned by this strange thing standing so close and upwind. The bull emerged from all the cover that had prevented any shots up to this point and eagerly approached the lead cow. I could not believe my eyes. Like a horse trotting up, I could feel the ground thump beneath the bull's feet. 
He was jogging right up to me. This is insane. As he passed through a bundle of branches, I lifted my bow and came to full draw. He closed in at 20, 15, 12 yards till he was directly below me and stopped nose to nose with the lead cow. In disbelief, I calculated. This huge bull I'd been watching was now broadside in front of me at 12 yards away with a large tree trunk completely blocking his vitals. I've never been this close to a big bull before. It was truly an intense feeling. The bull was absolutely transfixed on the cow, who was completely transfixed on me. You see, as the bull was approaching, she totally saw me draw my bow, but had to have been confused, overstimulated by the fact that this veteran bull was not alarmed, and he was jogging right up to greet her. So she and the other cow stayed put and did not spook on my draw. The bull was starry-eyed, gazing at this fresh group of cows, while my vision probed the tree trunk boundaries of his natural shield that he'd accidentally stopped behind. Could I sneak an arrow around the left of the tree and get in the back of his lungs? Or maybe just trust at this range my arrow would penetrate his shoulder blade if I could tuck a shot just right of the tree trunk. But God, what if my shot were to stray at all and graze the tree? Maybe half an inch on either side of the tree would work, but I concluded that these options were simply unacceptable. This was brutal. For like 30 seconds, the stalemate lasted until finally the bull came to recognize that this cow was completely ignoring him and locked on me. He turned his head and locked on me as well, and I had no shot at any of them. Another 30 or so seconds passed and nobody had flinched. At this point, the entire group of elk had sensed danger thickening the air. I felt the burn of every elk staring at me, picking me apart in ways that I was a foreign object and did not belong where I stood. With each second that ticked by, the tension escalated reducing the likelihood the bull would leisurely take the single step I needed for a shot, and more likely that everything was going to erupt in a chaotic mad dash away from me. I imagine no chance of getting a shot in that scenario. And that scenario was exactly what happened next. Like Olympic divers shooting from their blocks, the elk lunged in unison through the web of trees, branches, brush, and arrow deflecting objects of the sort. I recall sidestepping to my left, squatting at my knees, and bobbing my head side to side, trying to find any clear lane through the trees in which an arrow could pass. I located the zone that looked somewhat clear, and it was small, but it looked somewhat open enough, and more importantly, it was in the path of where the bull was charging. I just needed him to pass through it. Blurting out loud, my goat bleats begged the bull to stop, but to no avail. This encounter was plainly too close to coax any of the elk to halt their barging dash. While holding full draw pose, my left eye tracked the bull's massive body through the tiny peep in my bowstring, while my right hand navigated the needle point sights of my pins, attempting to land pins on tan hide. Like the fighter pilot scenes in Top Gun, except there's no missile lock that grabs and holds the target once moused over. In my periphery, I sensed this pursuit approaching the single lane that a shot could be possible. I slid my pins off the running bull and ahead to the narrow opening. He was running directly away for the most part, however slightly angling to the left and approaching the hole I could shoot into. Just as necessary, he entered that precious slice of negative space in a scene otherwise littered with arrow-stopping wood. I remember his huge light beige body surging up and down as he ran, getting my pins aligned and ahead, knowing I had to lead his body for the running factor in order to land a shot behind his shoulder. I continued bleeding like a goat as he slowed to a jog and looked back slightly at this perplexing sound. My finger dropped, opening the caliper of my release once again, and I watched in seemingly slow motion as my arrow sailed through the mountain air. Launching an arrow is a moment of suspense, like shooting a basketball from half court. Watching that arc unfold, the anticipation of where it will land when its up then down path comes to a stop. Early senses get a read if the shot is lined up. We've all heard or described knowing that a shot is good from the moment it leaves your fingers. But as the basketball falls, 
That's where it gets tricky. Backboard, air ball, rim, or net. The sound of an all net swoosh is in fact similar to the sound of an arrow hitting its mark. Like something of a snap, slap, or slurp, the sound can have a note of wetness or the crack of snapping bone. As the trajectory of my arrow's path fell into the shape of the bull's outline, it disappeared. Audio chimed instantly with a slapping wet report. As he crashed away through the timber, a tiny mark appeared. Somewhere midway up his body is all I could really tell. I thought it was a little high and back, around the last of his ribs, maybe? One thing was certain. I knew I hit him. And based on the angle and the center mass location, I knew the strike was fatal. I dropped to my knees, quickly set my bow on the ground, and pulled the hood off my head so I could cup my ears with my hands and listen. Crashing and thumping hooves filled the air, and though my eyes were closed, I imagined what was taking place. Sounds of running elk faded, and then all quiet resumed. Moments later, another barrage of sounds crunched and crashed through the air, followed by a crescendo of hooves fading, falling further and further into the void. I could paint pictures in my imagination of two different outcomes. Either that of the bull losing his feet and falling to the ground, dead, or that of him resuming his retreat from the area with a mortal wound and uncertain eventual outcomes. I'm no stranger to this situation or all the emotions associated with it. Thirteen times before, I've watched my arrow disappear into bull elk. Results and outcomes have varied. I've never watched a bull hit the ground. I've never even heard one hit the ground for that matter. But I've listened to all of them beyond where I could see. I've seen my arrow land in bulls in places I thought were absolutely perfect and yet never recovered them. I've seen my arrows hit in places that instantly filled me with regret. And with a few, I've been uncertain exactly where my arrow went. Each time I've dropped to the ground to focus on listening for clues, take stock of the situation, and get myself grounded in reality in measure of optimism. My shot could be called reckless, but it was executed with precision. I know what I'm doing. I am, in fact, a veteran elk hunter, archer, and marksman. Experience has led me to a place where I can call myself these things, and every shot at a living animal is reckless, as we do not absolutely control outcomes. We can only try our best for the desired results. We apply our skills, our best intentions, our hopes and dreams to harvest wild animals whose fate is to leave this world eventually in ways worse than bullet or arrow, yet rarely considered. When the moment arrives, we take our shot with reckless precision. Okay, hey there folks, we're back with the fifth and final chapter of my 2019 archery elk season. This chapter is called Luck of the Draw. There is a saying I've always repeated in my head during encounters with big game. Don't look at the antlers. It's a reference to keeping your composure and staying focused on executing the shot without the distraction of what the rack looks like. It totally makes sense. And in many situations, I've left myself yearning to know more about the rack following the encounter, or in some cases, the shot. Like any hunter, I want to let my eyes admire the critter, including its rack. I want to let my eyes scale each inch of antler. I want to imagine what it would feel like to grip those antlers in my hand. And so eager as I may be to see it up close and on the ground in front of me, my rule is to avoid admiring the antlers for the sake of focus, but also in hopes to find the critter like a Christmas morning surprise with just barely a peek at what's inside the wrapper. With so much time in the presence of this big bull, frankly, after several minutes, I had nothing but time and eventually began to peel back the wrapper a bit and start to admire this bull's rack. His main beams were strikingly long and heavy even at the ends. His left G5 had a unique curve to it, something I knew I'd be able to recognize and identify this bull with if I saw him again. He was a real beauty, wide, long, and heavy enough. Well over 300 inches, he was a grand representation of an upper middle class herd bull. 
But the way the circumstance had unfolded, I found my likelihood of a shot at this bull very unlikely. I still get excited. Lots and lots of adrenaline flows with the anticipation of shots. But I've noticed with the last few bulls, I've managed to stay much more composed than compared to the earlier days of my hunting career. I recall situations long ago of being so freaked out I could barely think, literally a deer in the headlights looking through my sights and too panicked to comprehend pins, yardage and such. Trying desperately to steady a wobbling aim is a feeling I can hark directly back to. And it's one of the things that first time hunters can never really prepare for. Unfortunately, adrenaline throws a lot of shooting practice out the window. As this big bull came trotting up and the realization sunk in that my shot opportunity was materializing right before my eyes, it was sudden. And despite spending so much time admiring the bull's rack, I was able to hold my focus and maintain vision to find a shot opportunity and executing it to the best of my ability. And it ended up being the greatest shot of my life. And Ian and I struggled to figure out how it even came together. You'll notice that I just mentioned Ian, after earlier describing how he and I had split up earlier that morning. Well, following my encounter and eventual shot, I let the dust settle, and then I began my signal calls, hoping that Ian would pass with an earshot and we'd be able to meet up. Blaring off double cow calls every few minutes, I moved up the slope a ways to where I hoped that Ian could hear. And eventually, he did, and signal called back to me. I was so stoked to make that connection and that I knew that he would come down and be part of this process and experience with me. Ian has been one of the few people I've hunted elk with on and off here for the past 10 or so years. He's an experienced hunter, although a bit green still in his archery elk career. He also carries a traditional bow, a huge chunk of self-imposed challenge I've yet to bite off myself. But those traits aside, he's just the kind of guy that everybody loves. A tall, dark, and handsome beacon of positive energy and witty laughter. Always an asset and never a liability. Ian has always been a great friend and in all sorts of ways. From fatherhood, fishing, garage beers, and all around just positive life perspective. Our wives are great friends. Our kids are great friends. We're neighbors even. So, when he's not off refing college football in September, he'll take extraordinary steps to make it out for even just a day or two in the mountains. So, remember in the last chapter when I mentioned needing something to stir the pot? So yeah, and like I described in that previous chapter, we'd split up, with Ian following a ridgeline down to where he was hearing bugles, while I dropped off the side to pursue the bugles that I had heard. Following our departure, we both got into elk. And I'll just let Ian describe what happened with his encounter. I was walking down the finger, and like I can just come up with whiffs of elk. And I'm looking down, and there's like fresh piss, fresh poop, fresh piss, fresh poop. And I'm like smelling the smell. And I can hear people. I'm like, all right, I think I'm like 150 yards away. And I come into about 100 yards. And I'm like, also just like creeping in. And I had just taken like, I was taking like three, four steps at a time and stopped and looked and listened. And I just, as I started taking some steps, I heard a crack. And I was like, Shh. so just one pop. And I stayed there for like 30 minutes listening, looking, waiting. And like 30 minutes later, I was like, I decided to give just a tiny cow call. And there's nothing. I was like, wow, well, I'm gonna go see it. They couldn't have smelled me. The wind was in my face the whole time. I took three more steps, and like all of a sudden, crashing. And like, elk went that way. I saw a few cows, like, bust left toward you. Did you happen to catch that group of cows bust left toward you? But I stopped and like took a video, and I was like, oh shit. Like, I just busted the herd out, they didn't smell me, but I know you're over here, I saw some animals come this way, and I was like, I hope they go by Brian. The elk, I'm sure, knew very well where each of these herds were located, but Ian and I sure didn't. So I suppose it's not at all surprising that when Ian bumped that herd off the finger that he was on, 
that when those elk bailed off the edge, they lined up to join up with the herd that I was standing among. But for me, this was incredible luck. And the timing of everything to maintain restraint and sit tight for just as long as I did, deferring on the coin toss to wait and see what the elk presented as opportunities on their own. And the way this group of cows trotted in just yards behind me and stirred the pot, pulling the bull right in front of me. Now that is some serious luck right there. Luck of the incredibly good kind. And then I was, you know, like started heading out. I was like, I'm gonna go to the spring. And I heard your, your double cow call that we agreed we were gonna meet up with. And it was down here, so I was like, well, they probably ran by him and he knows they're busted out. And I come walking down, dude, and your face was just like, and I was like, look to you, I looked away, look to you, you're like, I look away, I'm like, what? I'm, like, I'm about ready to start apologizing. And you're like, I have my backpack, I have my bottle, I'm like, dude, you got my and so now with this chapter break, we entered what is arguably my favorite part of this saga, the tracking. First things first, we attempted to figure out how the heck the shot came together. Looking through the 12 o'clock window that I'd shot through and trying to recreate where the bull was standing when my arrow connected with him proved more confusing than clarifying. In fact, Trying to align a shooting window with the bull's tracks, we never ever even got the puzzle pieces to fit right. At least not without cramming parts together or bending a corner off here or there. To this day, I still can't wrap my head around how the shot came together. Off and he's like, I'm out of here. And he whirled and ran straight down. And as soon as he was running straight down away, I started goat bleating, bat, bat. Back. And he just shuffled enough sideways. He went to the right side of those two dead sticks. Went to the right side, or those that, those two leaning. And as soon as he did that, he turned just enough of a little bit of a quartering angle and looked back at me. And I sent it. It was a good quartering away shot, but my arrow came in. I'm a little worried because it's high, but it came right in and sunk. I mean, it was just so um, now we're going to begin what's typically my favorite part of hunting, and that is following a blood trail because I love the CSI aspect of tracking. We'd given the bull plenty of time at this point, and so I headed down the tracks in search of first blood. It can take a while for that blood to start flowing and spilling out of a wound. And when an animal as fast as an elk is covering ground at full tilt, this can equal quite a distance of following dry tracks. And it was 30 or so yards down the tracks before I did spot that first speck of blood. Boy, look, he actually stomped on the top of that log. I did see more blood here. Yep. Good. This really only concerned me because the bull was running with an entire herd of other tracks. So there was a point we'd really need that blood to ensure we were following the right track. Let's keep mark on that one there. Little by little, small spots of blood kept us moving along the trail. Approaching 50 yards in, I thought it was strange that all the drops we were seeing were coming out the right side of the track. Now this was good in the sense that it indicated that my arrow had passed through the bull's body, but strange that visible blood was not coming out of the entry point on his left side. And the volume we were getting out of this right side was very light, prompting my remark here, comparing the scenario to the win probability tracker on my ESPN app during football games. Oh, yeah. Splatters. Boy, it's light. It can take a while for the blood to really get flowing, but we're getting to the point now to where I really want to see it start flowing in order to feel better. It's like watching a football game and the win probability tracker that swings that percentage oh, that's yeah. what this is like is like analyzing our how far are we how much blood should there be that we would hope to see yeah, how much are we finding this is a strange it's all coming out the right side i was a bit perplexed given the tracking was still so early on and we were really not even out of sight from the zone from where i'd shot i was far from worried 
Ian followed along behind me, stopping at each point of blood as I tracked onward, indicating where he could move up to to hold the next spot. Last blood's right up here. The tracks were headed for a mess of old downfall, and I scanned 40 or so yards ahead to look for obvious, easy to spot splashes of red on the clean silver canvas of barkless fallen logs. <laughs> oh, buddy. I didn't see any blood. My eyes landed instead on ivory tipped brow tines and the horizontal rack of that huge bull. I can't believe he's right there. I was just looking like in that downfall, like, all right, where's a drop of blood? Drop of blood. Moving into some downfall 30 yards ahead. Look for red. Oh, there's a bunch of brown antler. Oh, oh hello, my friend. <laughs> My gosh. Give me a hug, buddy. <laughs> oh. Great shot, dude. This is not Crown Point. This is not the bull that I shot at and missed second week of the season, but this is another really nice herd bull. I'd officially arrowed another herd bull and my largest bull to date. And like a number one rule that I've always had is like, don't look at the antlers. But after like the first couple of minutes, when you're just trying to wait for a shot opportunity, then all of a sudden they're just like sitting there. You kind of got nothing else to do except look at the antlers. <laughs> and I broke my own rule and I spent a long time with my eyes looking at these antlers and imagining what they felt like as they were swinging around the top of his head as he was staying hidden in the behind branches where he was so close but there was no possible way I'd have a shot. And look at that whale tail. How awesome would it be to just, ah, you just want to like bite them there. There's this visceral feeling of holding on to antlers that you've been looking at. It's just like, the solidness of the experience that's I don't know how to describe it taking an animal home is a fundamental of success of course it alone is not the only potential for success it is the bare bones objective of a hunt for me punching a tag is simply a bonus it's a reward it's not necessarily a statement of any prowess or achievement because harvesting big game is so dependent on luck. And luck is something that's totally out of our hands. No matter how good or bad we are, or how hard we've trained or practiced, what level of hunter we presume ourselves to be or wish to be perceived as. To me, it's a reward that either good luck made happen or bad luck missed and I slipped one past the goalie. I say this because I've struggled with monumental, mind-bending streaks of bad luck in the past. And I'm no better hunter today than I was 15 years ago. It's just that I've skated by with five years of good luck now. Prior to that, I agonized swallowing 10 consecutive seasons of bad luck and smashing defeats. In the final years before that streak was finally broken, it began to feel like a curse, so disruptive it made me feel foolish for trying harder and harder each season. It made me feel like success in the field was entirely out of my hands, and the more effort I poured in, the more laughable it was for someone or something. Walking around feeling cursed is not awesome. I can say that firsthand, especially for someone who doesn't even believe in curses. I've heard sayings to the effect that Luck is where hard work and preparation cross paths. I certainly agree that the more things a person is doing right, the better the odds are that the desired outcome can happen. But I've seen enough archery elk encounters in my time to know that no matter who you are or what you do, luck always holds the final card. So you better pick up that trash someone else couldn't be bothered to pack out. Smile and shrug when the inattentive driver cuts you off in traffic. And just be stoked for the things in life that catch your attention and remind you of how lucky you are. 
That's what I'm trying to do. And with 10 for 10 big game tags punched now in a row, I'm thanking my lucky stars every night. I'm Brian Husky. Thanks for listening and coming along. Okay, friends, that's the wraps on the 2019 Archery Elk Essay. There will be more coming up as teasers for next summer because we had a lot of memorable encounters that I would really like to share with you. But we're moving on for now. Thanks so much to all of you who are supporting my work with this project. I am diving in and making this the focus of my time these days. It's really just a natural fit for me. And enough people have told me that there's something special about what I'm doing. So I'm pouring my heart into it. Big thanks here to my friends, the Wrinkle Neck Mules, for the great tunes. And we'll talk to you guys later.